On March 7, 1964, Pope Paul VI celebrated the first Mass in Italian facing the people. Whereas Joseph Ratzinger and Pope Benedict, through his mode of recognize and resist to Paul VI, helped to promulgate and reverse this rupture, which had been promulgated by Paul VI, which vindicates the Trats. Brethren in Christ, love day to Jesus Christus and Secula. This is Timothy Flanders with the meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. Welcome to Pope Benedict Vindicates the Trads, Part 20. This is a show by Trads for Trads discussing Pope Benedict in the context of the post traditionis custodes era and regime to indicate and show the way and the model and very much the, the steel man argument using Pope Benedict for the traditionalist movement. As with everything at Meaning of Catholic, not all the opinions expressed herein will agree with all the hosts at Meaning of Catholic, but we need, we do need your support at Meaning of Catholic to continue this apostolate going. This is a lay apostolate. It's a collaborative effort between myself and many others who work behind the scenes, and it is supported by an online guild. The online guild is designed for men and women of faith, families to support each other online, internationally, against the Marxists. And your contribution helps to support this lay apostolate to continue to provide its content for free on the internet. You also get access to additional content as a guild member. You have uh, free books, additional videos. All the most controversial subjects are for guild only. So on all the difficult, uh, controversial subjects, you can have access to that at the guild. Uh, so you can go to patreon.com slash meaning of Catholic, patreon.com slash meaning of Catholic to support us. You can also donate at meaningofcatholic.com, click on support our work at the top, or you can always join for free if you need access to guild support, but you can't afford it. So just contact us at meaningofcatholic.com slash contact. So we're continuing the second part of the concept, the reality that Pope Paul VI promulgated rupture because it is often said, or it was said, for years after Sumarum Pontificum in 2007, that uh, we just need to celebrate a reverent Novus Ordo. You know, this is this is the way it was really promulgated. And, you know, if we read the text, um, and what we when we look closer, however, is that the reality is what I'm arguing here is that Paul VI actually promulgated a rupturous mass, but Benedict XVI and Joseph Ratzinger in a a, a proper way to recognize and resist and also save the face of his predecessor. He gradually reversed many of these things and instituted a more proper uh, promulgation of Vatican II with continuity and healing a lot of the ruptures. And there's many different aspects to this. And we've tried to go through this in this series. Now this is part 20. Um, God willing, I'm hoping that we can, wrap this up next week with the most important aspect of of this uh which goes to the root of this which is the papal power god willing we can wrap this up next week and and get on to um another series but we'll see um so today we're talking about another conspicuous aspect of the mass because the people who say you know we just need a novus ordo promulgated as promulgated uh you know they think that the novus ordo was promulgated with gregorian chant and uh, Latin and ad orientum. But actually, when we look closely at what Paul VI did, he actually promulgated the opposite of all three of those things. And so if we're really going to be faithful to Paul VI as promulgated, the Novus Ordo as promulgated by the promulgator, we have to actually celebrate the Novus Ordo facing the people, no Gregorian chant, and no Latin, or at least minimal Latin, minimal Gregorian chant. So today we'll talk about Another conspicuous aspect of that, which is the versus populum stance. This is, as as you probably are aware, this is the facing of the people in pretty much every church. It's almost unheard of that you have a Novus Ordo facing east, which is the traditional posture. So this is first, let me start off with a picture of the very first Italian mass by Paul VI. This is Paul VI in uh, March 7, 1964. 
So this is before the end of the council. Now, as you may know, the Socrates Sanctum Concilium was the first document that was promulgated or, or approved. Actually, Inter Merifica, I think, was first. But Sacred Sanctum Concilium was very early. It was uh, the only schema that was not rejected by the um, machinations of the European alliance at the council. Um, and so here is Paul VI. As you can see, this is a table altar that has been set up. Uh, away from the main altar, which is behind, it's to the back of Paul VI. Uh, it, behind Paul VI, you can see all the, the altar, the, the choir, all the um, ministers of the altar, the altar boys that are behind him towards the uh, main altar, the ma altar, altar facing east, and he has set up this table altar. Um, I mean, I would estimate maybe 20 feet in front of the main altar. So this was May the 7th, 1964, before the end of the council. Now, this was really what began a top-down effect, which went down from, from Rome to every single parish of the Roman Rite in the world. Because of the problem of hyper uber ultramontanism as we call it or this false spirit of vatican one i.e whatever the pope wills is the will of the holy spirit that would be the error of hyper uber ultramontanism um so clearly the pope wills it so everyone should just do it and uh, it doesn't matter if it's a rupture or not it doesn't matter pope wills it end of discussion that's really a jesuitical idea of obedience it's an it's an obedience that does violence to reason it does violence potentially to the faith. And ultimately, as we'll see, as Pope Benedict and Joseph Ratzker judged it, he judged it as a priest, as a public figure in the 1970s, as, we, as we've discussed, he judged this as a rupture. So um, now, now we move to the legislation that came out later that year. This document is inter ecumeni, uh, inter ecumenici, and this was it was, this was promulgated in September of 1964. So later that year was promulgated this document. This document is the instruction of implementing Sacrosanctum Concilium. So as you may know, there was Vatican II Sacrosanctum Concilium, which was promulgated by the bishops and the Pope. And then the Pope gave over the implementation of that document and the formation of the new mass over to the official committee, which was named Concilium, of which Archbishop uh, Bunini was ultimately the secretary and uh, the architect of that that whole group, Concilium. And this was so this was promulgated by Concilium with the approval of the Pope. So the Pope promulgated this legislation, which says on paragraph 91, the main altar should preferably be freestanding to permit walking around it and celebrating facing the people. Its location in the place of worship should be truly central so that the intention of the whole congregation naturally focuses there. So first we have Paul VI shows the example, obviously, and this was broadcast throughout the world through the media. And then he later promulgates legislation that says we have to make these freestanding altars, preferably so that we can celebrate facing the people. So now all the parishes throughout the world and the Roman Rite had to raise money and uh do violent architecture, uh, the, the violence of iconoclasm. Well, meanwhile, priests were destroying statues and whatnot. Now, to his credit, Paul VI didn't, dis didn't uh, destroy any statues, thank God. But uh, he did. This, this was, really was an act of iconoclasm because now we have all of these parishes throughout the world that are now, is this a promulgation of this legislation saying that now we need to have a freestanding altar so now we have to do a massive architectural violence to our main altar, to our sanctuary. Either we're, maybe we're ripping out the altar. Some of them did that. Um, I know at my parish, they ripped out the altar and, and threw it away somewhere and somebody saved it and, and kept it. This, this happened. Um, and then they built a table altar. And 99 times out of 100, it was an ugly table altar because at the same time, as, as you know, if you go to the Paul VI audience hall, um, there was this fascination with ugly modern art at the time, which is also iconoclastic because it lacks piety, because it lacks the piety for the forms of the forefathers, 
which were bringing forth beauty. It was actually a, a, an aesthetic movement of iconoclasm, which gloried in destroying the forms of the forefathers, the monuments, of the forefathers. So this is what promulgated. It promulgated a rupture by saying that we have to all face the people based on a false antiquarianism. Now, we could go back to Mediator Day, in which Paul, Pius XII actually warns against um, this false antiquarianism, which was essentially saying, <clears throat> well, the early church faced the people, so therefore that's better. Now, first of all, as we'll see, it's actually questionable whether or not the, whether or not the early church faced the people. In fact, it's, scholarship nowadays does not even claim that because it's outdated scholarship that people thought that at one time, but it's not true anymore. But even if it were true, Pius XII says in Beyond Today, that does not necessarily make it better. The early church also had seven year penances for adultery. You don't hear the modernists wanting to restore that great custom from the early church. Um, so the issue is that we have a situation where what's being promulgated and legislated by the Pope is a rupture in terms of this altar. So now we have to have this architectural iconoclasm um, in every church. So the so we have a situation where we have a recognize and resist situation. And this is exactly what Joseph Ratzker followed in the 1970s, as we've said in this whole series. So we have a situation where the Pope is doing something wrong, which is a rupture, and we have to resist it. And that's what Ratzker did. And we're going to talk about how he did it in just a minute. First, let me quote as well. Um, so no, one more historical note. Um, so Pope Paul VI, his favorite chapel in the Vatican was the Pauline uh, of Paul III, uh, also called the Finesse, <clears throat> excuse me, where he, Paul VI himself, had a, a table altar installed, which was a deviled egg shape that was resting in a bracket, which was particularly unsightly. Um, so he set the example, and this is what happened in churches throughout Rome, throughout his own diocese, was this iconoclasm of the altar, setting up these, these um, type of table altars. Now, let me quote from the general instruction for the Roman Missal, which essentially, this is the current legislation still on the books today um, on uh, the Novus Ordo, which basically quotes the same thing for, from Inter Ecumenici. Uh, paragraph 299, quote, the altar should be built apart from the wall in such a way that it is possible to walk around it easily and the mass can be celebrated as it facing the people, which is desirable wherever possible. Um, and then quotes the same thing. So this is really just a repeating what was already promulgated in 1964, as we said. Um, but, the, you know, we have these immense monuments of our forefathers, which are all these fixed altars that have been affixed to the wall for the celebration of the Holy Mass, according to the traditional orientation towards the East. We need to emphasize that this is entirely traditional. This is shared by all the ancient rites of the church. Um, many, many Eastern rites. There is a, um, I think it's an, a, a rehashed liturgy of St. James, which sometimes is celebrated facing the people. Um, but in the Greek rite, they do it. In the Coptic rite, they do it, both of which I've been to. Um, and so this is this is a rupture being promulgated and promoted, which is, a, is an act of iconoclasm, which is destroying these these main altars, which are, were de dedicated and, and our fathers sacrificed to make these main altars, uh, to make this beauty. But it is being destroyed uh, through the active or permissive will of the Holy Father. So... What did Joseph Ratzger do? Now, first of all, I want to just quote this right here. This is so this is Nova Advetera. This is a mainstream theological journal. And this is from an article by Ralph Weiman uh, called The Crisis of Faith and the Crisis of the Church. And this is Nova Advetera, Summer Edition 2021, Volume 19, Number 3, page 705. And this is where he echoes what we're going to read from Ratzker. So I'm just trying to show that this is an entirely mainstream argument that the trads had already been arguing for decades. But this is just a mainstream journal. Um, and he talks about the what's called the anthropocentric turn. The anthropocentric turn, 
which is where modern man just worships himself. And so the problem is that the, um, the anthropocentric turn is reinforced by the celebration towards the people. Here's page 705. Vyman says this, the celebration versus populum has become the most visible sign of the anthropocentric turn. This has far reaching consequences, especially since the church lives from the Eucharist. So it's not just a, it's just not, it's not just iconoclasm. It's the very heart of the, ch of the church itself, the very source and summit of our faith from which as Vatican II rightly says, we, the faithful gather all of our spiritual sustenance. And so we have a, a visible manifestation, a liturgical rupture manifesting the very heart of modernism in the very heart of the church. And this is precisely what Joseph Rathiger says. And in the uh, in his in his document, so in his in his seminal work in Spirit of the Liturgy, he has a whole section on orientation in the liturgy. So I'm going to be quoting from that. This is on um, this is in his complete works, page 47, though. Um, he says this. Now, note, note what he says here about Vatican II. We just demonstrated that Vatican II promulgated versus populum celebration um, through Paul VI. Pro remember, Paul VI is the promulgator. So what he does, he's the promulgating pope. So if you're going to change what he did, you're recognizing resisting what he did. Here's This is Cardinal Joseph Rasker in the year 2000. We've already talked about how Joseph Rasiger um, recognized and resisted Paul VI in the 70s and 80s and 90s and what he did. So here's what he writes around the year 2000. Um, he's saying that versus populum conformed to the primordial model of the Last Supper, another error, which was already in the in the general instruction in 1969, which was when which we had mentioned a, a couple of shows ago, which is where the general instruction originally said that the mass is essentially a, a repetition of the Last Supper, and the presence of Christ is the community, uh, not the Catholic doctrine. And that was the cardinals recognized and resisted that. And then Paul VI relented and promulgated a, a more orthodox doctrine. So um, here's Paul, here's uh, Ratzinger again. These arguments for versus populum seemed in the end so persuasive that after the council, which says nothing about turning towards the people, New altars were set up everywhere, and today celebrating versus populum really does look like the characteristic fruit of Vatican II's liturgical renewal. In fact, it is the most conspicuous example of a reordering that not only signifies a new external arrangement of the places dedicated to liturgy, but also brings with it a new idea of the essence of the liturgy, the liturgy as a communal meal, end quote. Now notice what he does there. He says that the council says nothing about turning towards the people. Well, that's correct. But the promulgation, as we've shown, did talk about that. Paul VI's promulgation in 64, with his legislation and his example, was promulgating and applying Vatican II to in be interpreted this way. So if you're going to go back to the text, as Ratzinger is saying, and reinterpret it in a different way than what the promulgator is saying, you are recognizing and resisting Paul VI. That's the reality. And that's what vindicates the trats, is that Ratzinger is rightly saving face, Paul VI. He's rightly saving face. You should try to save face as much as we can towards the Roman pontiff. We shouldn't just openly correct him as much as we can, but sometimes we do need to openly correct him, as St. Thomas says, as the trads have been trying to say, and as Joseph Ratzinger did publicly in the 70s. But as much as he could, it, it does appear that Ratzinger tried to save the face of Paul VI and not try to accuse Paul VI unless it was absolutely necessary. So in this case, he's basically reinterpreting the council and saying, well, we should reinterpret the council in a way that's not what Paul VI interpreted, but in a more faithful interpretation of continuity. So once again, notice what he's doing. He's he's invoking a higher principle than the Pope himself. The higher principle is tradition. That's the higher principle in which Vatican II must be interpreted. So even if the even if Paul VI interprets that principle in a rupturous way, we have to resist him and ask him and call on him and pray for him that he may turn his ways to uh, a, 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 a effort of continuity. Now I see there's, um, let's see. 
I don't, there's a lot of questions coming through. Let me just finish what, what I'm saying and we'll, we'll get to the questions here. Um, so here's, here's uh, some quotes again from the complete works of Ratzinger. This time going over to um, some, there's a, there's two, a section on this as well in the complete works. One is from Feast of Faith and the other one is from the forward that he wrote for the uh, Uv Michael Lang turning towards the Lord book in 2004, which argued for facing uh, the East. Now he says this, um, this is page 390 on the complete works. Since the 19th century, not only had the awareness of the lit liturgy's cosmic orientation been lost, but there was also little understanding of the significance of the image of the cross as a point of reference for the Christian liturgy. Um, so, this misunderstanding alone can explain the sweeping triumph of the new celebration facing the people, a change that had taken place with an amazing unanimity and speed without any mandate, and perhaps for that very reason. All this would be inconceivable if it had not been preceded by a prior loss of meaning within from within. Now he's now he's saying, he's claiming that there's not a mandate. Now we just demonstrate that there is a form of a mandate. Now it's not, not as explicit as it could be. It's it's half legislative and half, half de jure, half de, de facto. Um, but there is a mandate, certainly a mandate. When the when the Paul when Paul the Six erects his own table altar, and you know, in the presence of promulgating this, that's a mandate for the whole whole church. Um, but he's arguing that we should not see that as a mandate, and by arguing that, he's he's recognizing and resisting. Um, no, but then he he notes what Vyman, what I quoted from Vyman, he says. Rassinger says the danger is that, uh, well, let, let me, let me say this first. He says that, uh, the general view is totally determined by the strongly felt community character of the Eucharistic celebration in which priests and peoples face each other in a dialogue relationship. This does express one aspect of the Eucharist. This is Ratzinger's characteristic nuance. He is, you know, we can think of the cross itself, the crucifixion itself, uh, Christ is facing us. So there is a there is a sense one with the cross that Christ is facing us, uh, he's offering it to the Father, but he's also facing us, and also the fact that there is a there is the banquet aspect of the Eucharist as well. That's not the primary aspect, but there is that is one aspect of it. So it is important that we we shouldn't you know trads shouldn't be too hardcore and say you know there's no banquet aspect that would be too excessive. Uh, so Ratzinger does concede that, and that's important. But he notes he says. The danger is that it can make the congregation into a closed circle that is no longer aware of the explosive Trinitarian dynamism that gives the Eucharist its greatness. So that's that's exactly what we're saying here. Um, and this is the anthropocentric view, he says, the, this, this same thing that Vyman was bringing out. And then he says, his, his suggestion is, he would suggest that you have to put a cross on the altar, which actually... Which actually if you're facing the people, he says, you have to put a cross on the altar, which actually obscures the face of the priest. So the priest and the people have to both look at the cross. And that's actually, he, he says, this should be a necessary precondition for celebrating toward the people. So that's that was one of his solutions to that. The other solution was obviously to uh, bring in the Latin mass and ask for mutual enrichment. And when we, when we say, when we talk about um, uh, you know, restoring this continuity and this mutual enrichment, the fundamental aspect of this is allowing the Latin mass to have total free rights as Sumerum Pontificum did. And that's what influences a, a promulgation of Sacrosanctum Concilium according to continuity and not according to Paul VI. So if you, if you allow that tradition, which is the Roman rite tradition, obviously, then you... Uh, allow that continuity to organically bubble up from, you know, dual right parishes or dual form parishes. Now, he mentioned something else, however. This is from the forward towards turning towards the Lord. And that this document or this, this book, as I understand, I haven't read it, but uh, as I understand, this book is essentially an historical argument, which is arguing against the antiquarianism and saying there was never any tradition where the people faced uh, the, the priest face the people. There was a certain confusion because some of the Roman basilicas were facing west. And so you had to actually turn the altar different or turn differently to face to the east. Um, but 
in actual fact, according to the best scholarship, the current scholarship, there's really not this tradition. And so it's false to, to claim that in the first place. But he, as we said, even if it was true, that's not necessarily the case that, that that's, that's the best. Now he says this. Um, he quotes that quotation that we made from the germ from the general instruction paragraph 299, where it says the altar should be freestanding, which was the original legislation from Paul VI. Um, he says this. Um, this, this instruction was taken in many quarters as hardening the 1969 text to mean that there was not a general obligation. There was now a general obligation to set up altars facing the people wherever possible. This interpretation, however, was rejected by the Congregation for Divine Worship on September 25, 2000, when it declared that the word expedite, it is desirable, did not imply an obligation, but only made a suggestion. So what we have here is we have a reinterpretation of what was understood at least de facto, if not de jure, for decades. But the only people who were saying it was wrong was the Trads or Ratzinger. But now we have a vindication of the trads in legislation by the Congregation of Divine Worship in September 25, 2000. But now we have to this day, now we have bishops like uh, His Eminence Supich, His Eminence Gregory in D.C. are actually um, saying that we have to celebrate Novus Ordo. We have to even celebrate Latin Mass versus Populum because that's what it is. It means to adhere to Vatican II. Um, and as we're trying to say, that's kind of true to a degree. Um, but because of this reinterpretation from Benedict, he helps to reinterpret and restore a continuity by means of recognizing and resisting. Um, let me see what else here. So he, he and then he his his uh, preface to the turning towards the Lord book. Um, historical reachers has made the controversy less partisan, and among the faithful, there is an increasing sense of the problems inherent in an arrangement that hardly shows the liturgy to be open to the things that are above and to the world to come, end quote. So this, all of this act, all of these acts of Ratzinger helped to vindicate the trad position, which has been trying to uh, defend continuity against this movement of iconoclasm, which was begun and was begun very much from Paul VI, but also promoted by Paul VI, at least tacitly. So we have a serious, a serious iconoclasm where um, altars and statues were destroyed. Um, obviously, not all of this was approved by church authorities, but many of it was. Much of it was approved by church authorities, at least tacitly, like the destruction of all the pious monuments of the faithful. Uh, so this is a very grave offense against Almighty God and against our forefathers, which needs to be, which had to be corrected. And the trads recognized and resisted for decades until Ratzger started to help them through his own method of recognize and resist. So that's all we have. Let's get to some of your questions. Peter says, how can one forgive the Vatican reformers unless they actually admit they messed up with Vatican II liturgies and got it wrong? Um, Peter, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand exactly your question, but our Lord says that unless you forgive your brother from your heart, your heavenly father will not forgive you. So it doesn't really matter to me. I, I mean, I don't want to go to hell. So I, I think that, um, no matter whether or not the, the per perpetrator or the abuser or whoever, uh, asks for forgiveness, I have to forgive them if I want to go to heaven. Uh, if I want to have my own sins forgiven, I have to forgive my brother. That's what we say in the Lord's prayer. In the Lord's Prayer, um, in the Greek text, it actually says, forgive us our trespassers as we have already forgiven those who have forgiven, who trespassed against us. There's an aorist tense, which in Greek means something that has been passed. It's already been passed. It's already in the past. There's no further effects of it now. That's the aorist tense. So that's what the uh, our father says. So, you, so if you pray to our father and you want your own first sins to forgiven, be forgiven, you have to um you have to forgive your brother, no matter what he do he's done to you. Sean says, your argument is that the church was engaged in iconoclasm when instituting the table altar. I'm genuine ask genuinely asking. Um, well, the phrasing, we would need to change the phrasing here because there is a distinction between the church and churchmen. There are individuals in the church who commit errors or commit iconoclasm, whether that's the pope or the bishops or priests. 
But the church as, as an entity, as the mystical body of Christ, the church cannot err in such a grievous fashion. So I would argue that the church actually corrected the churchmen who were perpetrating iconoclasm through the, the providence of the Holy Spirit within a blink of an eye in terms of church history within 10, 15 years, it was, this was already being corrected. So we need to have hope that, the, you know, this is a situation that, you know, obviously we're in a traditionalist custodius era and that, and that's terrible, but we're in a situation where we can see God's providence already working in a blink of an eye. So that's a, that's a great hope. Um, Pedro says, I'm pretty sure the instruction or some other one explicitly said the old altar should remain and not be destroyed. I've never heard that quote, so you could send me your source on that. But I, I mean, if that's the case, good. Um, I mean, like I said, not all the iconoclasm was approved or promoted. You have a spectrum of, I'm saying that the table altar itself, erecting a table altar in front of the, 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 the uh, you know, the main altar and like neglecting that, that in and of itself is an act of iconoclasm. Um, but there's also, you know, I, I don't think Paul VI approved of destroying statues, but nevertheless, that was happened and he didn't do anything to stop it. So we have a spectrum of, of what was approved or promoted and, and what, what was uh, allowed to happen. Mary says, never like the priest back to the tabernacle. Supernatural faith would indicate that the priest is turning his back on Jesus in the Eucharist in the tabernacle. Yeah, this is, I, I mean, I think that the, the faithful, the, I mean, the faithful showed their senses fidelium. Uh, they, there was, there was a, I think that the, in my view, I definitely think Vatican II says census fidelium is infallible. I think that the, the instinct of the faithful to reject versus populum, either if they were weak in faith, they left the church or they resisted. Um, and the, the instinct that we see in the faithful of interacting with the celebration facing East. I think this is evidence of the fact that this is the instinct of the faithful. This is the instinct of the census fidelium. Um, Carl says, you cannot resist a valid pontiff, nor can a valid pontiff teach error set of a Kante. Okay. Um, that's never been promulgated by any valid pontiff. So show me a valid pontiff that has been promulgated that as a definitive act. Um, but otherwise you're contradicting your own stance here. Um, Proximus says, Tigantral, I know, but Nova Vetera is an unfortunate title for a trad Catholic publication. Wasn't that the very title of something published by Arch Heresiarch George Tyrrell circa 1907? Um, well, our Lord himself is the one who said the phrase Nova Vetera. So if George Tyrrell uh, abused the phrase of our Lord, I'm not surprised, but let's throw out Tyrrell and bring back our Lord. But that's not a trad publication. That's a mainstream publication. Um. Mass is supposed to be to represent Calvary. Yes, that's that's the critical thing that the uh, modernists did not like about Trent. And they were trying to promote the Protestant view of the mass, as we saw in the general instruction of 1969. Um, Pedro says this is not a teaching error, but a matter of discipline, which can be criticized as prudent, but not sinful. Yeah, sure. I mean, we can debate different levels of teaching. All we know, we certainly know that um, there's different aspects to the mass. Some of it is faith and morals. Some of it is discipline. Some of it is piety towards the monuments of our fathers. They're very different, all sorts of different aspects, but none of it is an ex cathedra statement. We know that much, <clears throat> excuse me. So it would be a debatable point as to what, how much infallibility is protecting all these other aspects of it. Um, but we do know at least that the promulgation did not promulgate anything invalid, sacramentally invalid. So the church is not deprived of sacramental grace. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Sean says, you keep using the word resist. I am not sure it means what you think it means. Well, I'm using the, the term resist in distinction to hyper uber ultramontanism. Hyper uber ultramontanism, which is what is, what is promoted today, is says that the will of the Pope is the will of the Holy Spirit. I, I, I argue that anything less than that is resisting because hyper-liberal ultramontanism is saying you must blindly obey everything the Pope says. So if, if, we, if we come down from that, uh, we're, 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 I'm setting up an analogous situation from Paul VI to Pope, Pope, Pope uh, Francis, 
we have the pretty much the exact same situation as uh, Paul the Six. So I'm saying that Paul the Six promulgated something. Joseph Ratzinger resisted it and did not blindly follow it. He publicly criticized it, as did the trads, and he vindicated various points of the trads. So therefore, I'm saying that Paul the Pope Francis has done very much the similar thing. So we need to follow the example of Ratzinger and recognize and resist that and call on the Holy Father to reverse this situation. Uh, Proxima says, saving face rather than direct statement is how current popes and bishops get to continue. That's true, um, but the Roman pontiff, the Holy See, also has a right to defend its own honor. And so even in a case where a prior pontiff has erred grievously, it is unfitting of the Holy See to uh, basically accuse his predecessor. That's just not fitting. That shouldn't. That should not happen. Um, there should be an understanding that we're reversing this while keeping the save, saving the face of the of the prior predecessor. Now it's different where it's different if we're talking about the faithful trying to communicate to the bishops. Um, I think that there, there's much more room for that. And we see that in Ratzinger's life as well. Um, Sean says, trads are too hardcore, though. They have assumed and inculcated for themselves a posture of resistance that is unfitting and due for loyal sons and daughters of the church. Uh, well, Sean, why are you judging your brethren in Christ so harshly? I'm trying to present something. Uh, obviously, trads, like all, like all Catholics, fall into sin. And, uh, you know, we all have issues. And I've tried to, in this series, I've tried to concede many issues that that are in the trad movement and excesses that, that arise, as I did in this show right here. But I would encourage you to be more charitable, Sean, to your brethren in Christ and understand a little bit more about their movement. You know, these are, these are faithful Catholics working to keep the faith in the face of violent iconoclasm to their spiritual relationship with Christ and not only that but their children there's this has been an attack on children's faith J Justin says what about since 1947 facing east would mean facing the state of Israel and the church wants the priest to face the people of God the true Israel the Catholic faithful um well the facing east is actually facing towards the sunrise so if you're in Asia you're facing towards the sunrise uh, even though you're geographically facing towards the Pacific Ocean and America, um, but you're still facing east. It's always facing towards the sunrise. It's not it's not facing towards Israel. That would be a Jewish thing because you would face in different directions um, based on where you are geographically. It's actually facing towards the sunrise. Uh, what about the encyclical Mysterium Fidei written by Paul VI? Says the Catholic doctrine and dogma cannot change. Promulgated two weeks before in closing session of Vatican II. Um, I'm not sure what what are you saying? Uh, yeah, that this is an encyclical as um, Paul the Six understood the dogma was under attack as he later promulgated his credo in 1968. Um, so this is a good act of Paul the Six. Um, right. Um, Golden Arrow saying, on the contrary, is because they are faithful in sons, daughters, church that they recognize and resist. Um, and then Sean says, where in the catechism or code of canon law or even in tradition that we are allowed to resist lawful developments of the church by our magisterium. Um, Sean, I would, I would encourage you to um, read a bit more of the trad scholarship because that that's, that is proven. And we've tried to prove this in various ways in this to topic. Um, but I mean, where is it? It is, it, it is there. I mean, we can, we can quote say Robert Bellarmine, which is quoted by St. John Henry Newman, St. John Henry Newman, interprets Vatican I by quoting St. Robert Bellarmine, which says it is lawful to resist a, po a pontiff. So um, it's it's there, uh, but you, you can read a little bit more in the in the trad literature for that. Um, let me see what else here. Justin says, also insofar as one promotes the Greek version of Catholicism as opposed to Latin rite, aren't they disobeying Pius XII in Humani Generis? I'm not sure what you're what do you mean by Greek version of Catholicism? Catholicism is 24 different rites of the church, only one of which is Latin, um, or, or 24 different particular churches within the Catholic church, and one of them is Latin. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. 
Uh, traditional Thomas, what's up, brother? He says, Pope Paul VI was heavily influenced by Louis Bouillet and Joseph Jungmann. Father Elkin Reed has debunked much of their theories, also table elders, extreme vernacular facing the people. Yeah, um, the um, great, great, uh, yeah, I, I, I will, we'll quote this um, next week, God willing, when we talk about the most important contribution of Benedict to the, the trad cause which is the understanding of papal power. Uh, this, this, di this book by Elkin Reed is very, very important. Um, Josef Jungmann was the one who promoted an antiquarian, uh, an antiquarian theories, which is the corruption theory. Um, so uh, th yeah, very, very important point. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, Sean says, that is a poor attempt to weaponize the laity against the magisterium. Tim, can you cite for us where in Vatican II that the sense of fidelium is infallible, moreover, in the manner in which you are claiming? Um, well, I would cite two documents, one Lumen Gentium. Uh, so you could just word search Lumen Gentium, sense of fidelium, it's in there. Uh, but then I would, I would quote the International, um, International Theological Commission uh, under the presidency of Cardinal Mueller. That was promulgated in, I believe, 2014, which talks about how the faithful are to resist shepherds when they instinctually, by sense of fidelium, understand that they are transgressing the faith. And this is infallible. Uh, you can also look at the sources from Kwasniewski's latest treatise, In True Obedience, where he quotes this. Um, so that those are my sources, but you could also just, I mean, you could just read the history of the church. There's, there's so many different examples. I mean, you could go to, um, here's, here's another text. If you want to read this text, Sean, love for the papacy and resist filial resistance to the Pope, which states numerous examples, including from saints where, um, you know, St. Bruno said that Pope Paul Pascal was a heretic and resisted him because he reversed the investiture doctrine of his predecessor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that is um, very important. So hyper uber ultramontanism is a term coined by Kwasniewski, which is tirelessly used as a straw man. Okay, um, I'll just answer this final objection, Sean, and then um, we'll close out. Um, so a straw man is defined by misrepresenting the position of your opponent um, in order to refute him and not presenting his argument the best possible. Um, hyper uber ultramontanism is simply a, I mean, you could call it whatever you want to. You could call it hyper papalism. Um, you could call it extreme ultramontanism. And the idea is that uh, this is a proposition, uh, as I said, which I simply defined as the will of the pontiff is the will of the Holy Spirit, no matter what. Now, few, I hope, would articulate that, but a lot of people, including yourself, Mr. McKenzie, um, seem to say that you can't resist. I mean, that was what you had just argued in this in this broadcast in your comments. Um, the idea that there is no room for resistance from anything that the Pope does uh, is implying that uh, one, it's either infallible or it's sinful in and of itself. It's intrinsically sinful to resist something. Um, and these are things that have not been defined or promulgated or clarified from Vatican I. What Vatican I says, and if you go to the Relatio, it says that he is only infallible. He uses the word only in the the relatio of gasser so and if you go and if you want another source sean if you want to go to um saint john henry newman's um letter to the duke, duke of norfolk he says that uh one's own conscience properly formed by the way not your modernist conscience which whatever way you want to do but john henry newman saint understood vatican one to be that if there was a, a resistant there could be a resistance to the pope on various matters that are outside an as catherine statement so you know we could just go to a newly promulgated saint and read his his you know a bishop who was at vatican one and you can read these things for yourself um and so it, it's it, it, actually you know we could also um we could cite john henry newman in his letter to um his friend john saint ambrose where he says that he's scared that the that the actual Vatican I dogma will be used to promote 
an excessive papalism. Uh, so this is not a straw man. This is something that John Henry Newman himself was, was afraid of in 1870. And I think that he predicted properly what would come about by that, because that will, that's what we begin to see is that we see a, a, a sharpening of the faithful all around the Pope as if the Pope is the ordinary magisterium, when in fact his office is often being itself exercised as an extraordinary magisterium, at least before Vatican I. So that's a perfect way to transition to our, our final broadcast next week, hopefully final, maybe, maybe we'll have one or two more because this is such an important issue, but um, which is the topic of hyper uber ultramontanism or hyper papalism or extreme ultramontanism, whatever term you want to use, but I've defined it right uh, in this in this broadcast. So we'll talk more about that and we'll talk about how how does that relate to the liturgy and how does Benedict vindicate the trads once again in this most important issues. So sorry, we don't have time for more comments, but um, please uh, donate to uh, patreon.com slash meaning of Catholic that helps us continue to do what we do. Um, let me get our our icon of Our Lady and let's play Ave Maria. And all, always that um, all of our pious acts, whether that's acts of resistance or obedience, in all our in our consciences in this difficulties, you know, if even if we disagree that we our consciences may be purified by Our Lady's intercession, because all of our good intentions are always stained by pride. So we ask Our Lady to accept our offerings, poultry they, though they may be, and to to purify them of pride and to send us the grace that we need so that we may be perfectly formed as Catholics and piously offer up the true sacrifice of the Holy Mass and our lives to Almighty God. In nomine Patris et Fili et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tuum liarbus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostrae. Amen. Our Lady of Victory, pray for us. Saint Joseph, Terror of Demons, pray for us. Saint Anthony of the Desert, pray for all clergy and seminarians. In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Jesus is King. <laughs>